And now for our scripture unison reading. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth <clears throat> and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall lie with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the cat kid, and the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child. And now it's that. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. All right. So we have Benjamin, Benjamin, and James, and Sam, and Alexa, and Eliana, and I don't know your names here. Say it again. Maggie, and Yemi, and Owen, and Matthew, and Declan, and don't tell me Mario, and Isa, and your, your names are? Patrick and Caroline. Ca Caroline is my middle name. I love that name. And my mother is Jeanette Caroline and my daughter is Eve Caroline. Love that name. Awesome. I, I was campaigning for it to be, the, to be her first name, but it didn't work out. Anyway, so I've got a secret. And it's hidden under here. We had it all set up last week. And I just, um, but look underneath. <gasps> it's called a do you know what this is called a table. a table do you know what that is called all those figurines it's called what uh, say that again i'm not sure what i'm not sure what you're saying yes yeah. a manger oh that's a good word um a manger is part of it a manger it um it's all moved around it's called a crash. And a crèche is, is French for crib or manger. And the manger is where um, baby Jesus was laid after he was born. But we're not there yet in the story. And I thought um, we would tell the story, or start in, in the weeks to come, we'll tell the story of Jesus' birth. The story begins with star. a star, right? A star, a new star appears in the sky, and a lot of people didn't notice it, but some, we call them wise ones, in the east saw it, and they were like, huh, what's that about? And they decided to follow it because they believed that something special was happening, hap happening and it took them to where? What town? A Jesus town. Jesus town, okay. I, I, Bethlehem, you get a star. Oh, there you go. All right, so, so that's the beginning of the story. But who do you think the first person to hear about Jesus being born is in this story? Who do you think? Yes, Yemi. God? God, well, yeah, God initiated the whole thing. Somebody else. Sam. 
Jesus' mom. Have you ever seen, I think this is the coolest thing. If this is a pregnant Mary. I've never seen a crush that had a, had a pregnant Mary. So nine, nine months? It doesn't have a face. That she doesn't have a face. Yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> Kurt, who, who is a, who's the Saxon who cleans, will appreciate that you said that because it, he doesn't like the fact that they don't have faces. But it doesn't bother me. So anyway, so Mary, Mary I don't want to cover her face, but Mary... Um, was the first. And she was visited by, who was she visited by to tell her? An angel. There's an angel here somewhere. Okay. Visited by an angel who told her. Yep, that's it. Nobody has faces. (laughs) Okay. I could so run with that, but I'm not going to. Okay, so uh, Visited by an angel who told her, guess what? You're going to have a baby by the Holy Spirit. Well, her first, when she's told she's going to have a baby, what's her first response? And by the way, she's about 13 years old. At this, yeah, what? Right? So she's really young. And she's like, I haven't, I haven't had sex with anybody. How am I going to have a baby? Right? And, and the angel tells her it's by the Holy Spirit that you're going to have a baby. And... Mary is known in Scripture because normally when somebody is told in, in Scripture people got, that God wants them to do something, their first response is, is to say, okay, great. Their first response is to say, are you sure? <laughs> Not me. Pick somebody else. I don't think I can do that. Mary was curious. She says, how can this be? And angel says, because God makes it possible. Nothing's impossible with God. And she just says, okay, let it be with you. Let it be for me as, as you say. Now, somebody else, she was engaged to be married to. Who was she engaged to be married to? No. Joseph. Joseph. Joseph was told in a, in a dream, right, that, that uh, he that he should continue to be engaged to Mary, that he should marry her, and um, why are they kind of like because they, they wore robes like this? Yeah, why does he have a mask? it's not a mask, it's a beard. just a beard. Oh. Do you see a beard? Why is it a beard? Joseph, we don't know how old Joseph was. There's lots of there's lots of guesses. A lot of folks think that he was older. Yes. Sam. They were wearing bathrobes all the time. Yes, yes. Why does he have a beard and no face? Because it was made by Willow Tree, and that's how Willow Tree makes the, all of their, their characters. They don't put faces on him. And I think, I think that's fascinating that you picked that up right away. Yes? Does Willow Tree have a face? It's a company that made this. And I think... I think we're just supposed to imagine for ourselves and not be get so particular about what they actually look like because we can get fixated on that and that um, and and just use our imagination a little bit. Okay, so that's where we are in the story. There's a lot more characters under that table, right? So we're going to talk about them in coming weeks. But um, do you know what? I was hoping to do this last week, but we can do this this week. So the first... And there's a whole bunch of you. And I think we have enough. Let's, here's, we're going to do stars. Do you have your trees up yet? Yeah. You're not doing it? Not everybody does trees. Oh, you got one? A tree? You have a tree? So you can put those on your tree. Um, to remember, do you think you're getting one? I have a friend, Peter, and his family. Did you get and his, his family, they do it on Christmas Eve. Can you believe that? One more, right? Did everybody get one? Here you go, Yummy. All right. So... <laughs> 
between now and Christmas, when you're outside at night, I want you to make sure that you look up at the stars. And I want you to, first of all, it, on a clear night when it's really beautiful and you can see all the stars, just want you to take a deep breath and just think to yourself, wow. And then I want you to be reminded to thank God for Jesus. Can you do that? Yeah. All right. Let's hold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads. And we're going to pray. Gracious God, thank you for... Jesus, thank you for this time of year where we remember what a gift he is to us. And I pray that everybody stays healthy in the coming weeks. Um, and we pray for our Sunday school teachers today with I, all of these kids, praise God, and just pray that your message of, of love is planted in our hearts each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So late. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with the water for repentance, but the one who is coming more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Wilderness as metaphor for the hard hearts of the people. Think about that for a second. If you were to go to the Holy Land today, there's, I, I haven't been, and I know that, that some of you have. They have all of these sites that uh, if you want to, my, I remember my grandfather saying, I got to walk where Jesus walked. You know, but it's not, so much is not what existed when when Jesus was there, because it's been a long time. But if you look out to the wilderness of Judea, that's what they saw 2,000 years ago. According to Bible.org, bleak, inhospitable, stark, and harsh, the wilderness of Judea has sat virtually unchanged for thousands of years. The Israelites wandered in this harsh land with very little water and learned to trust God. That's a positive spin. They complained a lot. They doubted. They whined. They even longed to go back into slavery. In the wilderness, we're in this nowhere place. We're neither here nor there. We're told that we're headed someplace and to stop asking, are we there yet? We're told to be patient and wait and to stay faithful and trust. And we're not very good at this. Does that preach to something in your life? Gosh, yes. The pattern in scripture is for people to have some kind of liberation and then go into the wilderness. The Israelites out of Egypt. David wrote his poetry in the wilderness. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Was written in that harsh landscape. So it was a spiritual truth, not an, an actual truth. Jesus baptized retreats to the wilderness to be tempted, to be tested. It's not that we go to the wilderness to find God. We find God who calls us out into the wilderness. But here we have a story of people who go out, leave their homes and their work, and the watchful eyes of the soldiers, because remember they're under Roman occupation, to journey into the wilderness to find a man who, and how, how would you describe John the Baptist? His, his looks, we just read, He wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honeys. That, and wild honey, that's an allusion to the prophet Elijah, who we are told was expected to return before the day of the Lord. So all the Jews listening to this story would go, ha, got it, duly noted. Our gospel writers all want us to, they're very clear to say, John was the one who came before. He was not the Messiah. Why? Because John was very popular. He had a following. He had disciples. His message was one of repentance. The the Greek is metanoia. It's a change of heart, a change of mind. Why were the people going out to see him? And he got so popular that the religious types heard word of it and got curious and wanted to go out as well. Pharisees and Sadducees, who were not friends. They were competing sects within the church. If John had found favor with the people, it's possible that they were there to curry favor with John. It would look good for them. And we, you know, we see this happen even today. Presidents of the United States will ask religious leaders to, to the White House to come visit. It's an honor to be invited. It looks good to your constituents. You're like, look who I'm rubbing shoulders with. I'm told that back in the day it was good for business to go to church on, on Sunday mornings. You wanted to be seen as upstanding. It was a place that you could make connections. So I'm not sure that everyone's motives were pure going out into the wilderness to see John. And then when they get there, John says, you brood of vipers. It was believed at that time that vipers, which are snakes, would chew their way out of their mother's stomach when they were born. So this is, you know, it's not like a, a, a light insult. It's a huge slap across the face. And he says it in in this gospel, in the gospel of Matthew, to just the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But in the gospel of Luke, he says it to everybody. And then he says, bear fruit worthy of repentance. In other words, do something. One, don't think just because you're born in a certain ethnic group that you're, that you're cool with God. Modern day, just, you know, just because you call yourself a Christian, whoop-de-doo. Two, <laughs> I'm just thinking, you, know, you brood of vipers versus whoop-de-doo. But anyway, two, get out of your heads. Stop arguing scripture and try to live scripture in a way that glorifies God, that shows the character of God to people. Nowadays, we would remind people that we are the only Bible that some people will ever read. Our actions betray our hearts, betray our minds, betray our faith. So I'm guessing that the people who were coming back into town after going to see John in the wilderness were changed in a way that made other people think whatever Kool-Aid they're drinking, I want some. But the Kool-Aid wasn't sweet. There was no sugar. It had no ice. It was harsh words that call us to accountability. Make faith a verb. Repent. And John points to Jesus who is coming and talks about burning the chaff with an unquenchable fire. Now, we are all part grain and part chaff. 
We all have things, attitudes, prejudices, vices that we need to be released from. When they talk, when they would um, uh, separate the, the grain from the chaff on the threshing floor, they would take the stalks of wheat and they would hit it on the ground and the wind would blow and it would take the husk or the chaff off the grain and let it blow away. And they said, that, that will be burned. All of us have things in us that need to be burned away. But it's not like, okay, <laughs> I'm not looking at anybody. I'm not looking at you when I say, but it's not your grain and your chaff and your grain and your chaff. Or worse yet, oh, we're all grain and they're all chaff. We're all a mixture. And the good news is that we will be released, that in the power of God in us can help burn away the things that are not of God. We all need to be released to be freed, to bear fruit in the world. So John's message was harsh, you brood of vipers. It was urgent. The axe is at the base of the tree. There's a modern song, people get ready, Jesus is coming. Soon we'll be going home, right? That urgency. And then the concrete is repent, repent, bear fruit, make your faith a verb. I used to carry around a quote in my wallet by, by Gandhi, and it was this, happiness is when you think is when what you think and what you say and what you do are all in harmony. That's the Kool-Aid, I think, that they were drinking. Which makes me, uh, since we're celebrating communi communion today, it makes me think of a dear uh, Robin. At my church in Morton, we had, at one point we had five Robins, so we all had to have nicknames. And Kitchen Robin, uh, who used to prepare communion for us, one week she came up, to receive communion, and she had a little smirk on her face, and I, and I looked down, and I mean, I had noticed, but I'm like, wow, this, you know, this juice, you know, is really red today. It was, it was fruit punch. <laughs> she didn't have grape juice, so she decided to use fruit punch, and I told her after the service, I'm like, I think next time that should be a group decision. <laughs> Because I said, I, when people came up to receive communion, I don't think they were thinking, oh, thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. I think they were thinking, huh, that was fruit punch. Right? And I said, I have a secret stash of grape juice in my office. Next time, <laughs> ask me. But uh, when I think, when, think about Kool-Aid, I think about that. When we celebrate communion, we drink. And we hear the words, this is, you know, my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. I tend to say this is cup of salvation because we can be very literal. Jesus modeled for us what faith looks like lived out, that love is sacrificial. God's love for us is something that we receive and then we give it away. To receive, and we come back to this table again and again and again and again because we need to. To be reminded that we are forgiven. To be reminded that we are freed to live faithfully. And to be reminded that God is with us in power and spirit each and every day. So when you journey through the wilderness of your lives, and I really do think that the hard part out in the wilderness and receiving the message and, and people's spirits say, yes, I want to be baptized. Yes, I want to follow God. The hard part is going back to town. The hard part is living, leaving the sanctuary and going back into our daily lives where the pressure is to not mess with the status quo, to just, just go with the flow. But living a Christian life is disruptive. It's, it's, it goes against the values of our culture. And we are, we are going to be sitting in Matthew for a while. And Matthew 25, where, and I talked about this last week, the, the separation of the sheep and the goats and how we are, how we are to live by you know, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, uh, visiting those who are sick and in prison, giving clothe, clothing to those who are naked. That, that's how we're supposed to live. Our denomination has called us to be a Matthew, to really sit with that scripture, and we're going to be doing that in the coming weeks and months, sit with that scripture, and they have boiled it down to the, the, the disruptive, living out the gospel of Jesus Christ means things like dismantling racism, it means working for economic justice. It means working for church vitality and what that looks like. 
Being a Christian is countercultural. And the, and the tough stuff is bringing it back into our daily lives. We will meet resistance, but we will also meet admiration from folks who say, that's integrity. That's somebody who's really trying to do it and live their lives faithfully to Jesus Christ, living what we believe. So we pray that the wind might blow through us, that we might find ourselves free, that we might bravely live out our faith so that others might think, I want what they have. In Jesus' name, amen.